The following podcast is sponsored by Structure Tech. If I could just design my dream house, what's that going to look like? Sure. Through the lens of, of a home inspector. Yes, yes. Sure. Number one, I think for me and Tessa, we've talked about this, is going to be water management, right? I was just thinking that. Yeah. It's making sure that all of the water that comes down and hits the roof gets carried well away from the house and In a perfect world, all of those walls are going to stay bone dry even during a hard pouring rain. In my world, that's perfect. This is Structure Talk, a podcast from Minnesota's most highly rated home inspection company, Structure Tech. We're the people who do home forensics and deliver the unbiased truth about your property. Structure Talk is hosted by our home inspection specialists, Ruben Saltzman, Tessa Murray, and Bill Over. Welcome to Structure Talk. Today, we're going to venture away from the technical building science part of this conversation, and we're just going to dig into the perfect house in the eyes of a home inspector. What does it look like? What when, makes you go yes? And, when and you so walk? when you say perfect house, you're thinking, what would I want, right? If I could just design my dream house, what's that going to look like? Sure. Through the lens of, of a home inspector. Yes. Yes. Sure. Number one, I think for me and Tessa, we've talked about this, is going to be water management, right? I was just thinking that. Yeah. It's making sure that all of the water that comes down and hits the roof gets carried well away from the house. And in in a perfect world, all of those walls are going to stay bone dry even during a hard pouring rain. In my world, that's perfect. And it means, ideally, you don't have a single valley on that roof. You have a super basic roof design. It's a hip roof, all ridges, (laughs) no valleys. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect roof. Mm -hmm. And you have huge overhangs, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know what's really funny about that, Ruben? Driving around a lot of new construction developments, you know what we see? The the opposite? Yes. (laughs) Yep, we see the opposite. It seems like it's the style now to add these little gables on the front of the house. It's called gableitis. Gableitis, thank you. To add a little bit more, you know, architectural interest. Yeah. But what does that do for water management? And and just for anybody who doesn't know what a gable is, it's a triangle. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, A useless triangle. (laughs) But it's pretty. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There are neighborhoods that you can go to in some of the first ring suburbs where it's just hip after hip after hip after hip and there's two and a half, three foot overhangs and you're like, oh. Yeah, that was really smart. They had it dialed in. They weren't worried about aesthetics. Okay, so you manage the water. Life's great. Now what? Well, and the other stuff for managing the water, I mean, not only that, have, have big overhangs, but gutters. Gutters take all that water away. Instead of all the water running off the roof and then kind of sitting next to the house, you have gutters, downspouts, downspout extensions taking that water way out into the yard. And then think about where those downspout extensions are going to terminate. I mean, if you take all the water from the front half of the house and then you shoot it out into the front yard a little bit and then it just soaks into the ground, where is that water going to go? Is it going to come down into your basement? Where are you going to put your downspout extensions? Does it have to pass over a walkway? Mm -hmm. If it does, then somebody should have thought about that ahead of time. So planning all of this stuff when a house is built, that's a good idea. And grading. Oh my goodness. Talk about grading. Yeah. Yeah. Once it does get down to the ground, where does it go? Yeah. I kind of like to see when the foundation sticks out a little bit. It gives you a little wiggle room, right? Maybe a block and a half is visible and you're not you're not challenging Mother Nature. Totally agree. Yeah, Yeah, having the foundation stick up above the ground for a couple of courses maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean today it's probably gonna be a poured concrete foundation. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna have concrete courses but whatever having it stick up yeah you see that a lot in some of these city houses though what do they call them the four squares where they're just there's two and a half you know blocks sticking out of the ground so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the opposite of that is when you have an older house and it's it looks like it's kind of getting eaten up by the surrounding grade and it's kind of sinking below ground right yeah. the house isn't sinking the, just the grade is, the grade but. has been piled up and piled up and piled up next to that house and now now their their wall framing is actually below ground level yeah, when you say wall framing, you're talking about the wood that yeah. sits on top of the foundation wall. It's such a challenge when you inspect these houses because you're like, what do you tell people? I mean, you can't tell them to easily regrade. 
I mean, what what are you going to do? Dump dirt up against the house and now bury the wood? Yeah. Well, no, that's a, that's a sure recipe for yeah. rot. Yeah. Do you leave it alone and let water just leak in your basement? You got to do something. Those are challenging mm-hmm. to describe. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're managing water. That's all cool. Drainage and grating's great. Overhangs, good roof line. Love it. What do you recommend for siding? Personally, I mean, nothing's going to outperform vinyl. It's a fantastic product. It's not a very good looking product. I'll admit that. And I say somebody who has had a vinyl sided house, it doesn't look great, but nothing's going to outperform that when it comes to water management. Vinyl is just a rain screen. It's a first layer and it protects the waterproof barrier behind it. And if it gets damaged, you slip out a piece of vinyl and you pop a new piece in. It's a great product, but I mean, as far as looks, I would much prefer something like LP James, or James Hardy. Exactly. Or, yeah. yeah. LP Smart Side or James mm-hmm. Hardy. Not the yeah. old clapboard. You know, <laughs> yeah. That you have to paint every other year. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what homeowners yeah. do. That's I, what we're supposed to We're supposed to get out there yeah. on a ladder and maintain. Let's go. That sounds like a lot of fun. Mm, I, no, thanks. Oh. You were probably going to say this, Ruben, but the, the one type of siding that I, would make me a little bit nervous is newer stucco. And also with yeah. that, stone veneer. Yeah, lumpy stucco. Lumpy stucco. Yeah. Explain. Well, you know, you you see a lot of stone siding today. It's Mm -hmm. it's a gorgeous product. There are all different flavors of it. And really, it's stucco. Think of it as stucco. It's it's the same thing. It has a little bit different look. It's these concrete chunks that get stuck on the wall, but it it performs exactly like stucco does. All the problems that we had with stucco in homes built about 1990 and newer, we're having all the exact same issues with with stone veneer. But you know, we should save this talk because this is this is going to be like a full podcast episode. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, I'm going to ask you to just explain that a little bit more before we move on to the next topic. Sounds good. Are you looking for peace of mind when it comes to buying a home? Structure Tech is on the case. At Structure Tech, we provide a comprehensive menu of inspection services so you can make the most intelligent decision on your home purchase. We also offer radon testing, mainline sewer inspections, level two chimney inspections, and specialized stucco inspections. Structure Tech, delivering the unbiased truth. Please visit us online at StructureTech1.com. You're listening to Structure Talk, brought to you by Structure Tech, the most highly rated home inspection company in the Midwest. Delivering to you the unbiased truth about your home. Okay, we promised that we weren't going to do anything technical. We were just going to talk about all the great things that we'd love to see in a house. But Ruben, I need you to explain just a little bit more about bumpy stucco and newer stucco, just to contextualize it for everybody who's listening. Sure. What what it comes down to is there was a lot of changes that started happening with buildings right around 1990 or so. And it was a lot of changes that happened at once. If it had been one change, like we simply added an air barrier at the wall, we might not have had all these problems that we had. If, if it had just been the stucco formula changed probably would have been okay but we did probably about five or six changes all at the same time and houses started to rot out i mean water would get in behind the stucco water wouldn't come back out walls would stay wet for a really long period of time and then you'd have mushrooms growing out of your walls and (laughs) and they'd have to tear stucco off of entire faces of walls to the tune of you know in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars i mean serious problems when we drill into that, that's going to be a great podcast, and we'll go deep dive on that. So we're we're talking about siding. Tessa, what, what would be your siding preference? Uh, kind of like you said, vinyl is, you just can't outperform vinyl. Yeah. I think it's great. It's cheap. It's easy to replace pieces. It's inexpensive. It's inex- Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> it's inexpensive. But, it's uh, cheap too, Bill. But Who are you the, kidding? The look of, <laughs> just kidding? I think the look of LP, in my opinion, is really nice. Yeah, I do like it too. Yeah. Agreed. There's something classic about the overlapping siding. Yeah. yeah. I yeah, like it too. I, I like the look of wood, but I'll tell you this. I mean, I've mentioned this house I used to have in Minneapolis. I had, uh, what was it? It was redwood. Mm. So, I mean, expensive durable. wood. It's very durable. And wouldn't hold paint to save its life. Oh my gosh, that thing Did you have to peel. fight the woodpeckers on that too? <laughs> no, I didn't have woodpeckers, okay. th- peckers, thank yeah. goodness. But I mean, I've got a friend who's a painter and we took this thing, we <laughs> scraped it down to bare wood all over. We took this stuff that was like, it was basically like Elmer's glue, or whatever this stuff was. And we, I mean, it was super thick. We rolled it all on, guaranteed to fix all of my paint issues. And then we painted it and it was 
probably about a year and a half later, pain started peeling again. Why? Do you think you had a moisture problem going on inside that house? No, it's because the wood never should have been painted. Mm. And there Just was no... stained? Sealed? What yeah. are you supposed to do? Yeah, that's it. As soon as they started insulating walls people started having these problems. Mm -hmm. So I don't like wood siding. I've had bad experiences Mm -hmm. with it. If people just stain it, yeah, great. But if you you paint it, boy, you can have problems. Hmm. One thing we didn't talk about was windows. And I know as a home inspector, I always love seeing the classic double hung windows. They're durable. There's a screen on the outside, kind of deflects some of the water. And so I, I always like to see double hungs myself. Some of the newer casements seem to had like an aluminum clad over the top of them. Some of those seem to have leakage problems and things of that nature. But double hungs seem to stand up to the test of time. Do you have any preferences window-wise? I don't. I mean, mm-hmm. personally, I do like the fact on a, a casement or a crank out window, you get the whole opening is openable area. Uh, you only get half of that on a double hung, but whatever. I like them both. I don't have a preference on windows either. One thing that I would not get if I were building my dream house would be a room above a garage. Mm-hmm. And, Amen. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> they're great. It's wonderful. I, I like the idea of it. But what always ends up happening is the same thing you have on a one and a half story home. You have, you've got, you know, like six surfaces. You got front and back walls, two side walls, the ceiling and the floor. There's your six surfaces, your cube. You've got one of those that is touching a heated space. The other five, unheated. What does this create to us? Yeah, comfort issues. Yes. Yeah, those are going to be cold bonus room. Who cares? Oh, so many people complain about their bonus room being cold in the winter, uncomfortable. Yeah, the short answer to your question, Bill, homeowners. Homeowners. <laughs> That's who cares. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and we know this from hearing all the complaints. Yeah. It's almost impossible to keep those things comfortable, Very at difficult. least when you got hot and cold days. And for those homes that have plumbing that runs through those tuck under garage areas or bathrooms that are located, I'm sorry, <laughs> especially in our cold climate. One of the more challenging homes that I inspected was, for some reason, they had a pipe, a, 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 a supply pipe ran right through the garage that was not heated. I have no idea what they were thinking about doing, but it was there, and it had been repaired because it had broken. Yeah, you could see where it was frozen spliced and burst. Yeah. yeah. Well, we talked about story and a half houses last time. That, if I see a story and a half house, well, there's no way I would buy a story and a half house. Knowing what I know as building scientist, I'm sorry, Bill, I would just walk away from that. Enjoy your outer ring suburban yeah. home. That's all I'll say. You know what? I, I would be happy with a ranch, a rambler, 1950s, 1960s rambler, or a two-story house that has a flat attic. Any type of house that has a simple, easy design, a square box, it's going to improve comfort issues, reduce cost for HVAC, you know, roof, siding, all that for a simple design. Yeah, it looks ugly, but it's functional. And also the attic spaces are accessible and so you can do good air sealing insulation work as well. So wow. for me, it would be a very simple house. It'd be an easily accessible attic, one flat attic. How about the basement? And what the, would you have in yeah, the basement? Would you finish it? That's a great question, Ruben. You know what? If I was picking my dream lot and it was sandy soil on a hill and I had a poured concrete foundation that had waterproofing on the exterior, which is required by code, and insulation on the exterior, rigid foam, and drainage underneath the slab, and insulation underneath the slab, I think I might finish it. And, maybe. And there would be <laughs> drain tile. Maybe. There would be a drain tile system and a sump basket and sump pump. I think I might feel comfortable finishing that basement. Now, would it have to be a walkout? That would be nice. Yes, I would like a walkout basement as well. Okay, I love walkouts. For I me, I almost have to have a walkout. It doesn't feel I'm, like a basement anymore. Yeah, it's walk. not nearly as bad. You got yeah. a lot of light coming in. It's, I mean, you can have the deck easily put above it. You, you get shelter there. I love that. So for me, I, I love the idea of a walkout for sure. The opposite of my ideal basement. A lot of these sandy limestone 1900s foundations with poor water management, and they're just starting to crumble. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you've seen those. And every time you Um, kind of wipe your hand against the wall, you got a bunch of the wall kind of coming down with it. Yeah. I call that the root cellar. Yeah. Yeah, but then people finish them, and water ends up making its way through, and you get wet basement issues. Okay, Ruben, what do you like to see in a house mechanical-wise? What I would love is to have that basement and have in-floor heating. Mm. That is my perfect home. 
That's R- nice. Right? Yeah. And, and we're talking about you're going to have a boiler, and today's boilers are going to look look a lot different than the old school ones that took up a big chunk of the room. Today, they're, they're basically mounted on a wall. They're about the size of a tankless water heater. You almost can't tell the difference between the two today. It fires up. It heats water. Water flows underneath your concrete slab, and now your concrete floor is just toasty warm all throughout the basement. Maybe you put carpet on top of it. Maybe you put something else on top, but it's warm. Heat's radiating up, and it might not be like you step on it and your feet are toasty warm, but this is gentle radiant heat. And not having that cold floor just changes the entire environment. I mean, Bill, you and I were chatting earlier today about how you're saying, you know, it's, it's, I set my thermostat at this temperature, yet I still don't feel comfortable. And it's all about what your outside walls and your ceiling and your floor is doing. And if you have a heated floor and you have warm walls, you can actually turn the temperature down and be just as comfortable. So I love in-floor heat. My dream house someday is going to have that. (laughs) Have you ever blogged about that? I've mentioned it in a blog post or two, but I've never blogged specifically on the topic of in-floor heat. It's probably the only topic you haven't blogged on. (laughs) You know what? I take it back. I think I have. I think it was a very long time ago, like 10 years (laughs) ago. I bet you I could dig that up. All right. Uh, Can you tell everybody where to find it? Yeah. Structure Tech blog. If, If you... Go to Google, you type in Ruben's Home Inspection Blog or the Structure Tech Blog or just Home Inspection Blog. It should Mm -hmm. be the first thing that comes up. Great. Well, so you're saying furnaces don't um, move the needle for you? You know, that's the traditional type of heat and you need some way to make your house comfortable during the summertime. And for air conditioning, it relies on a forced air delivery method. And it it would just get basically cost prohibitive to have in-floor heat throughout your entire home plus have an air conditioning system. But I'll tell you, if I did do that, I would probably go with a ductless mini mini split. split. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tess, do you get the Journal of Light Construction? Yeah. you read that? Yeah. Oh my gosh, they have so many articles about those. And it's got to be the greatest thing since whatever came before it. I think they're great. (laughs) Okay, so dial it down a little bit for those who are not reading the Journal of Light construction on a regular basis. What is a mini split and how is it different? It's that thing, if you go to a hotel, you got this big box on the outside wall and it blows cold air or blows warm air out of there. That's basically what it is. It's one of those devices that gets mounted on your wall. So are we talking an individual furnace or air conditioner in a separate room all around the house? That's basically it. Yeah. And these things are powerful. They move a lot of air and you have some type of air delivery method to move, move that air from one room to the next. But the beauty of these things is that they get scaled up and down. When you have a traditional system, you turn on, you know, just about any of the air conditioners out there it's full on. It's like as cold as it can get instantly, and it's going to try to cool the house as fast as it can. If it needs to get two degrees cooler, it'll go hard as fast as it can, and then, and then it shuts off. That's not an efficient way to do it. You're not going to be removing moisture from the air the way that you should. With these systems, they scale down. And they'll run for, you know, whatever they've figured out they need to run for at, say, 20% capacity. If you only need to drop it down two degrees, they'll do that over a longer period of time to do proper dehumidification. Okay. And I know we're getting geeky here, but what it really comes down to is they create much more comfort and Reduce they cost humidity. less. Yeah. yeah. So in-floor heat's not moving any air. A mini split is moving air, but these are self-contained units. Mm-hmm. So how do we make a house, the indoor air quality, good? How do we move that air around? Because you can't just breathe the stale air. Yeah. You need to have some sort of ventilation system in your house for good air quality. And so the best way to do that is through balanced ventilation, right? You want to have, you know, air that's that's being taken out of the house and new fresh air that's being brought in. And so a lot of times it's an air-to-air exchanger. It's a heat recovery ventilator or energy recovery ventilator that's in use. But the challenge is making sure that they're installed properly and that they're balanced. Now, those are all great for new homes and they're basically required. But I'll tell you, Bill, if I were just to have my dream home and I could do this without any big penalties of a bunch of warm air leaking into the attic. This is my dream home. It may never happen, but you know those houses where you have a whole house fan 
It's like it's like a jet engine that's installed at the ceiling of the highest level of your home. I would love one of those things. I am very much a windows open in my house yeah. type of person. Yeah. And if, if the outdoor temperature is somewhere between about 60 and 90, I want my windows open. I hate turning on my AC. And with these whole house fans, you flip that fan on, making sure that all of your windows are open, of course, and it sucks in outdoor air through everything. And it, it'll cool your house down very quickly. Those are the greatest thing ever. I would love to have one of those. The only problem is that it's really tough to put that on your ceiling and insulate it properly in the winter and make sure that it's totally airtight. Mm -hmm. With all that, it's almost like, yeah, maybe I wouldn't have maybe one. Maybe in a different but, climate you could have that. Yeah. It would work better. Yeah. But boy, I, I don't think I've talked to a single homeowner who has one who doesn't love it. <laughs> Everybody loves those whole house fans. Seriously. <laughs> Tess, what do you think about them? Yeah, I th <laughs> if you like your windows open, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You don't. You like it freezing cold. I like my air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, I was going to be like, thanks, Grandpa, for the tip. <laughs> I'll just, I'll talk to Jay. Jay's on my side. Oh, oh, my gosh. Don't get me started on what we keep our, our thermostat set at. This summer, it'd be like 95% humidity in your house at all times. I know. With that thing the on. humidity is, ugh. That's, that's why I like the AC. I I can't stand the humidity. There you go, folks. That's perfection in the eyes of a home inspector. Ruben, any last words before we go? You know what? One last thought, Bill. I did a quick little search here, and I really did blog about in-floor <laughs> heating. I did a blog post <laughs> over you. 10 years ago titled <laughs> Boilers versus Furnaces. So if you want to hear what I had to say on it 10 years ago, you could check that out. I'm pretty sure I haven't changed my mind. I'm pretty sure I feel the exact same way. So you go to StructureTech1.com, type in Boilers versus Furnaces. You can read all about it. Clearly... It's important that anybody in a real estate transaction consider a home inspection, and it doesn't matter where the house is in its life cycle. It's super important that you find a qualified home inspection expert to come out and do a thorough evaluation of the real estate you're considering. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time. For more information on how we can provide you with the right information about your home before you buy or sell, Contact us at StructureTech1.com.